Well, good morning. Welcome to church. Um, I miss standing out on the street wearing, having a sign that says smile when people drive by. So I got a mask that's got a smile on it because there are a lot of frowns out there. So I've seen a lot of different masks, but thanks for coming today. Thanks for joining with us. And we're going to, if you would like to stand and sing with us, we're going to sing, Come, Now is the Time to Worship.
glad that he conquered the grave. Aren't you glad for salvation? You may be seated. Well, I'm glad to see you in church today. The Supreme Court of the United States of America has made an initial ruling that churches can assemble inside. So, no matter what you might say about the way our country's going, at least we still have religious freedom. The freedom to worship. Now, it's still with restrictions. We're still going to only have 25% of, of, of capacity and take a temperature and make you wear a mask and keep you at arm's length it's not because we don't love you it's just that we're asking you to stay at arm's length i will say this uh, we know people that have had covid people in our church that have had covid but there's been no outbreaks from us assembling together because people if they think they've been exposed they stay home and thank you for doing that if you've been exposed until you're clear from a test but we are uh, grateful the supreme court uh, made that decision and i saw a note from the governor's office that said well governor newsom will consider it a little further and i'm like well he can consider it all he wants um we're going to have church we're going to meet together as the lord has called us out to do and we're going to keep doing that so uh, thank you whether you're here in the services today or whether you're watching online it's a blessing that we have that you know, God wants us to assemble in his name and around the world. People are assembling in places so that they will be sort of hidden. So that people don't find them. People don't know that they're assembling because the government has said you can't assemble. But we still have the freedom to assemble together. So I'm thankful for that. Uh, Virginia has let us know that she's doing better. And so that's a blessing. And uh, Damien and Ruth, they've had good doctor's appointments Damien with his health issues, Ruth with her pregnancy. Uh, I was not feeling well this past week. Uh, I do thank the Lord. We had a good service Sunday, and we baptized a young lady. Um, uh, back in the back, some of you were able to come back and to see that, so that was always neat to see somebody saying, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. And so uh, she got baptized, and we thank the Lord for that. And... Um, but I, I went home and I just basically collapsed and I didn't feel well. I don't know if I had a stomach bug, but I appreciate all the comments. We canceled the Bible studies and uh, everybody, everybody from the Bible study said, Pastor, we're praying for you. And, and Donnie goes, let me know how you're feeling. What you're feeling? What are your symptoms? And so I started naming them and he goes, um, you know, those are COVID symptoms. And I said, oh, great. And he goes, well, I just went and had a rapid test done. And he said, Pastor, I'll pay for you to go get a rapid test. And I said, no, it's all right. And he goes, somebody paid for me to go, and I'm wanting to come by and bring you the money so you can go and have it done. And so Tuesday afternoon, I went and had a rapid test done. And they said that I'm negative for the flu and for COVID. So I was thankful for that. And I started feeling better, not because of the test results, but I just started feeling better on Tuesday. So uh, I thank the Lord. I've been feeling a little bit better all week. Just some kind of a stomach flu or something. So um, I'm not going to want to share it with you, and I don't think you want to have any part of it. So we'll continue to observe our arm's length, okay? Uh, we'll stay that way. But uh, we have a lot of things to be thankful for. We have beautiful sunshine out there and god is taking care of us and and uh, it was great to have our missionaries with us and to see them and to know that they're doing well and excited about going back to the field and so those are blessings those are things to be thankful for um, we do want to pray some of you see i saw on the prayer chain that uh, isabel's aunt had been released from the hospital to go home into care because of covid and her aunt passed away last night uh, so we want to pray for Isabel and her family. Uh, we also want to pray for Dorothy. While Dorothy's rejoicing over being 96, uh, her health has gone downhill recently. Uh, David called me this morning and said um, that she's not been eating, not been wanting to take her medicine. Um, her vertigo is really bad. 
And so they're going to try to get her in to see a specialist. But he said, please, please, please have the church pray for my mom. He said, uh, it, and he was broken up about it. He said, it's hard because I'm having to help her get in and out of bed and get around. So pray for Dorothy today that the Lord will be there. Um, pray for Yvonne and Debbie. Good to see you ladies here today. Um, pray for them as they're looking for housing, that the Lord will open a door for them to have a place so that they can get taken care of. Be on their own, foot loose and fancy free, right? <laughs> free to stay up as late as you want and get up as late as you want right all right you ladies deserve it you put up with households of kids for how long and so now you can sort of yeah yeah all right uh, pray for the bisbee's neighbors um, they're all doing better but the grandfather passed away and so we want to pray for them uh, what's the family name okay so we'll pray for them, that God can be with them through this situation. All right, we will continue to pray for those that have um, the COVID, that they're, fa they're battling with it. For, um, uh, it's, it's getting better at the Potter household, but I know they would, they would appreciate prayer. Uh, continue to pray for Virginia. Pray for Bob and Carmen and Oscar with cancer and Kevin with cancer, um, that God can be with them. I'm, I'm glad my mom was able to be in the services with us today. She came up for the weekend uh, for Ruth's shower yesterday and um, taking her home today. And uh, she got her first vaccine, so we're glad, uh, glad for that. And uh, keep my mom in prayer for her health, for her back pain that she's in. Um, so pray for the Soto family, for Kathy and her family, that they'll get permanent housing that they need. Pray for the lost. Pray for people that need Jesus, that they might come to Jesus, and pray also for unspoken requests and work needs. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. We come before you, Lord, thanking you for answered prayer. For my health, you were with me and you helped me through this past week. I thank you, Lord, for the uh, vaccination my mom was able to get. Uh, thank you that Donnie's doing better. Thank you for the negative test for myself. Thank you for Damien and Ruth doing well. And we're thankful that Virginia is doing better. Lord, a lot of answers to prayer, things that you've been doing and working. We thank you for the one that was baptized. We thank you for the ones that I talked to yesterday morning uh, that seem to be interested in studying the Bible and knowing what the Bible has to say. So, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the Bible studies and the Zoom classes that we're having. We're thankful for the fact that we can meet together uh, openly. The Supreme Court has made that decision. We pray for spiritual needs, Lord. We think of Liz's family and Peggy and Blanca and Kathy and Larry and Tim and Alex and Philip and Samantha and Harry that you might be with them and help them to find salvation. We pray for the Biddlecoms and the Hotzels that you might have your hand upon them. We pray for our work needs, those that have job situations for David and for Damien and for Debbie. We pray for the unspoken requests. We pray for housing for the Soto family and for Yvonne and Debbie. And we pray for Isabel's family as their aunt has passed away and the neighbors of the Bisbees uh, where the grandfather has passed away from COVID. We pray for others that have been affected, Lord, with family members that have passed from COVID, that you might give them strength. And we pray for Dorothy today with her struggle with vertigo and nausea. Lord, I would ask that you might help her and give her strength for the day. Uh, be with Debbie as she's not feeling well. Be with these with cancer for Bob and for Carmen and for uh, Kevin and for um, uh, uh, man, lost my lost my train of thought, Lord. But we pray for these with cancer that we're concerned about that have cancer and fighting it because of it being such a terrible situation that you might be with them and help them, Lord, and be with their families. We uh, pray for a dear friend of mine whose brother is in stage four and does not have long to live, and so we pray for him. We ask that you might be with us in our service, Lord, that we might have your hand and your presence here. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we are going to continue to talk about a thrill of hope. A thrill of hope 
and we're particularly arrowing in and narrowing it down to hope in God's unfailing presence. Hope in God's unfailing presence. To know that God is with me all the time. Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in the green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for Thou art with me. Thy rod and Thy staff, they do comfort me. Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of my enemies. And we can go on, but the important part is, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, You're there. You're there. Uh, we've seen some. We've seen people in the Old Testament where uh, very openly uh, that God said that it was said that God was with them and helped them through things in their lives. And we saw last week where God uh, from Psalm 139, where God in His presence in our lives will do some things for us. Now Jesus very openly said to His disciples, "I'm with you always, even to the end of the age." And of course, we know, well, Jesus went away up into heaven. Uh, what, what's, what's up with that? And, but he sent the comforter. He sent the comforter who came and did things and helped. The, and that's the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit indwells us and the Holy Spirit helps us make decisions. And the Holy Spirit helps us know things. But today, we're going to read from John 15, a very interesting little statement about the vine and the branches and about how God's unfailing presence can help us. In John 15, verses 1 through 8, it says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Uh, this was something that was very common in the land of Israel. Uh, a lot of places they had vineyards. Uh, and today you can visit vineyards. You can go to Temecula and visit vineyards. And there's vineyards around and, um, uh, to see what they do, whether it's grapes or raisins or grape juice or wine or whatever they do uh, as they get these vineyards together and, and gather the products from them and they work very hard at it. And so people would understand and know exactly what Jesus was talking about when he said, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Now, at the end of the growing season, they cut the grapevines back. And so if you come along and look at them, it looks like a trunk of a, of a plant that comes out of the ground and then it usually has two outstretched branches that are on a wire that supports it. And then they, they cut those back at the end of the growing season. And then as, this, as the winter passes and spring begins, then all that starts to branch out again to produce fruit. So they always are pruning them back. Maybe you have a, a, vin, a, vine, vin, a vine at your house, and so you trim it back to a certain point so that it will produce fruit. They knew exactly what he was talking about when he said, I am the true vine. I am the vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch that is in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. And they knew what they were talking about because as those branches begin to come out of that vine, they look at them and if there's not any little buds that are going to become grapes, uh, grapes, they just cut that vine off. And if they look at one and they see that it's going to have some little bunches of grapes on it, they might prune it back a little bit. So it puts all of its energy into producing fruit, not producing more leaves, not producing more, uh, more branches that go out a little further, but producing fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless you abide, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, 
you are the branches. That's why we have God's presence to help provide for us, to give us what we need to make it through our lives as a believer. He is the vine, we are the branches. All right? And so we'll see some things that he says about that. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you don't stay connected to God, you're not going to get the sustenance you need. And you're going to be cast out of the branch and withered. It doesn't mean when it says they gather them and throw them in the fire, it doesn't mean you're going to go to hell if you're not connected to God. If you as a believer have been connected to God and you decide, I'm not going to do the Christian thing anymore. I don't want to, I want to walk away. Your life is going to shrivel up. You'll be of no use to God. And God may say, well, I, I don't need them there anymore. They're not doing what I need them to do. But it does not say that you'll lose your salvation. Nowhere in the Bible do we see verses that say that you can lose your salvation. Your salvation belongs to God. It's in His hands. It doesn't belong to you and in your hands. It's in God's hands. And God holds on to that what He gets. Your name is written in His book of life in ink that cannot be erased. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So as we are in the presence of God, as He is there in our lives, He's going to sustain us, and we need Him as desperately as a branch needs the vine. A few weeks ago, I, I worked uh, our yard crew very hard. Um, Jerry and I were working, lopping off pepper shoots off a pepper tree that we had to take out of here years ago. And Phil was raking leaves. And we loaded up the back of my truck, I think, and filled up the dumpster with offshoots of the pepper thing because it just comes back. It just, it, you can't stop it. But the interesting thing is, is once you cut it off from its sustenance, it's done. It doesn't grow on the ground by itself. So uh, when we were, we actually had to do it over the course of a couple of weeks. So we found some things that we had trimmed off we just hadn't picked up. And they were all shriveled and dried up. Because they weren't connected to the source of sustenance. When I understand that God is with me, that He's the source of my spiritual strength. He's the source of what I need to make it through life. That helps me. Because He has an everlasting supply of what I need. Do you believe that? And He's paying attention and He knows exactly what's going on in your life. You are the vine, I am the branches. God's presence in my life gives me guidance and very particular guidance so that I realize that I need to bear fruit. What did it say there as we read it? Every branch in me that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. God is the vine dresser. God is the one that works with the branches to make sure they do what they're supposed to do. I'm intrigued by seeing what people can do with plants. And we have a couple of plants at home where as they began to grow, they sort of braided them together. Have you ever seen plants like that in the store? Maybe you have one at home. Or uh, where they'll have a tree that'll grow a certain way and they'll do some things to it and bend it to their will and it'll, it'll have like a branch that runs between two trunks. That's always very interesting to see what people can do with time and energy to force a plant to do something that the plant doesn't normally do. 
God's presence in your life will help guide you, but He wants you to realize that He wants you to bear fruit. He has a purpose for you. He wants you to do something. We, and we talked a little bit about this last week, that our lives have purpose. He wrote in His book, the book of our lives, what we were supposed to be doing with our lives. What is my purpose? Well, God knows what it is, and He'll help you find your purpose. But one of your purposes is, one of the things that you're supposed to do is to bear fruit. Now, we'll talk about fruit in just a moment. But He is going to work. Here in John 16, verses 7 through 11, and in 15 and 14 and 16, Jesus talks a lot to the disciples about the Holy Spirit. Let me encourage you to read John 14, 15, and 16 and find out what he says about the Holy Spirit. But he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So the Holy Spirit, one of His jobs is to convict. When you convict something or someone, it's because you want them to change. I was convicted of my sin when I was very young, and I said I need to repent and change my life, and that's when I became a believer in Jesus Christ. I was convicted in college because I had said, I'll do whatever you want me to do except this. And God convicted me, and so I changed and said, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. God will convict you. He convicts the world of sin. That's how people come to Christ. They realize they're sinners. And of righteousness, that's how I know how to live the right way. Amen? It's not a mystery to me how God wants me to live. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God will help me to know how to live the right way. And of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you shall see me no more. So they can't go to Jesus and say, Jesus, what do we do in this situation? The Holy Spirit will help them to know what to do. In the book of Acts when they were told not to talk about Jesus anymore. They went and they prayed and they said, God, help us to talk more about Jesus. Talk about praying the opposite of what the government wants you to do. Help us to talk more about Jesus. And the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke the word of God with boldness. They were not afraid. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you shall see me no more. So they... They consulted God through prayer and God gave them the Holy Spirit to tell them what to do. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Let's look at Philippians chapter 7, or chapter 3, pardon me. What things were gained to me? The things that were important to me, those I've counted lost for Christ. Yet, indeed, I also count all things lost. For the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through the faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul says, I would get rid of everything in my life so that I might allow, if you will, the vine dresser to guide me in the right way I should go so that I can bear more fruit. Are we willing to follow the guidance of God? It might mean having to surrender some things. He said, I count all things but loss. 
so that I might know God and I might know what God has for me. Are we willing to surrender everything so that he can guide us to having fruit? In John, we see this, 1 John chapter 2. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Now that's saying that we ought to be walking like Jesus Christ. All right, pastor, uh, where's the store that I can go to and get a pair of sandals and get a robe? And I know I'm a woman, but I will try to grow a beard so I can be like Jesus. That's not what it's talking about. I, I can only have olives and grape juice and fish and unleavened bread to eat. No, that's not what it's talking about. Look in the Gospels and see how Jesus worked, how he ministered to people in their place of need, and, and how he blessed and how he spoke into people's lives. That's what God wants us to do. And so that's part of the fruits that we're supposed to be producing if we're connected to the vine, which is we know we're in God's presence and we have guidance so that we can produce fruits. I don't know if you've ever been working with a plant enough to say, I want this plant to produce some fruit, so I'm going to do what I have to to force this. My granddad took me out in the garden and we were looking at his tomato plants. He had a lot of tomato plants. And he said, okay now, sugar, this is what I want you to do. You go down the tomato plant and you look at it, and if the blossom is starting to shrivel up, I want you to pull the blossom off. He says that's the best way to grow tomatoes is once that blossom has is, is been pollinated by a bee or whatever, and once that blossom has done its job, it'll start to shrivel up and you pull it off so that doesn't so not that tomato's not affected as it's growing. Uh, to my shame, when I was a young teenage know-it-all, I said, "Granddaddy, what would you like me to do for you?" Cuz I don't want you to have to do it. He he said I need to have my garden plowed. And he had a little hand plow, a little wheel with a little plow on the bottom of it and a couple of handles and uh, he said I need to have my garden plowed and I said well I don't want you to have to do it granddaddy I'll, I'll do it for you I'm young got back there uh, 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 struggling around to maybe get it two inches deep three inches deep granddaddy never told me this but my family did later you know granddaddy went back out he didn't want to make you feel embarrassed but you didn't plow it deep enough he went back out and plowed it again to get it deeper. Because granddaddy knew how to produce butter beans, tomatoes, squash, green beans, corn, gran watermelon, granolope. Granddaddy knew how to produce. Obviously, I didn't. I was just a city boy. Okay? But God is the husbandman. He wants to guide us because He wants us to produce fruit. Not our fruit that we want to produce, but the fruit that He wants us to produce. Okay? So that's one thing to know about the presence of God in our lives. All right? God's presence in my life gives me sustenance so that I might bear fruit. God's presence in my life gives me sustenance so that I can bear fruit. Now, God is going to guide me to bear fruit, and He's going to give me sustenance to bear fruit. He's going to give me what I need. How many of you have ever prayed for patience? Wouldn't it be awesome if 
You could just come to church and say, Pastor Walt, I need patience. And I'd say, okay, let's step into my office for a minute and I'll open up a cabinet and take out a little bit of a hypodermic needle and say, okay, roll up your sleeve. I'm going to give you a shot and you'll have patience. Wouldn't that be awesome? That's not how it works, is it? You say, I need patience. And so God helps you develop patience. Everything that will try you can and will happen until you develop patience. So we jokingly say, don't pray for patience because that's what's going to happen. You're going to be learning patience. But that's the way that God does a lot. But He gives us what we need. He is the vine. We are the branches. We get sustenance from Him. If you know anything about a tree, a bushes, plants, any kind of plant life, you know that it, once that limb is broken or that branch is broken, even if it's still hanging there, it's not getting the sustenance it needs. That comes from deep down. The fruits of the Spirit are listed in Galatians chapter 5. The fruits of the Spirit. These are some of the things that God would like you to have in your life. And so He's going to give you sustenance so that you can have this fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, which is patience or temperance. Against such there is no law and those who are christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires if we live in the spirit let us also walk in the spirit the fruit of the spirit is love i I thought i already knew how to love somebody not the way that god wants you to love them not the way that god wants you to love them the next sunday is valentine's and we're going to be talking about how god gives us hope through his unending love his great love that he has for us and we're going to talk about that kind of love if you start looking at the kind of love that god has for us that he wants us to have towards others our husband our wife our children our parents our neighbors right Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength, everything you are, and love your neighbor as yourself. How can I do that the right way? Well, I need to get that from the Holy Spirit because I, I, want, to, <laughs> I want to love them the wrong way. Okay? No, we have to have the fruits of the Spirit. We have to have the fruits of the Spirit. And that comes from God to us. Philippians chapter 1, Paul said, I'm going to pray for you. This I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So if I believe that God wants me to produce fruit, I have the hope that God's going to help me produce fruit by His presence in my life. And I want to listen to Him and pay attention to Him so that I can produce the fruit He wants me to produce. That's what I have to know about His presence. We'll look at one more verse on this. James chapter 3. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him or her show by good conduct that their works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there can i read that again one more time for where envy and self-seeking exist those are not fruits of the spirit 
My fruit of the Spirit is self-seeking. And so it's all about me and not about anybody else. My fruit of the Spirit is envy. I'm envious of everybody and I try to chop them down so they can get to my level. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not fruits of the Spirit. Those are fruits of the devil. Okay? Confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So God will give me sustenance to help me develop the fruits that He wants. I'm fascinated by those that do grafts, that do grafting together. And they'll take one type of apple and they'll put a branch on from another apple and they'll make a new type of apple. How many of you like to eat red delicious apples? Red Delicious Apples used to be the number one eaten apple in the United States. You know what the number one eaten apple in the United States is right now? Honeycrisp. Honeycrisp. And so all the people that are growing Red Delicious, uh, they're finding out people aren't buying those apples. And so they've been forced to convert. And they have new flavors and types of... I, I never knew there was that many. Envy and Jazz and... How many of you like Granny Smith's? With a little bit of salt. I think you kids would raise your hands for anything I said. Golden Delicious. Remember Golden Delicious? A lot of those apples have sort of faded because they have new varieties and it's, it's turned the apple producers upside down because, well, what apple is going to be successful? Let me tell you that the fruit that God wants you to have is the same fruit that He wanted Peter and John and James to have. The same fruit that he wanted Christians of 500 years ago to have is the same fruit that he wants you to have. It hasn't changed. It's not the flavor of the month. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now the next part of this is, is a little bit harsh to say. But we did read, every branch that is in me, he prunes so that it might bring forth more fruit. Pruning is removing things that don't produce fruit. Twenty fourteen, the last of November, the beginning of December, I was scheduled for my first colonoscopy. So I got that big jug of stuff that you got to drink and I drank it all night. Went the next morning to see the doctor and have my colonoscopy. And he said, I'm a little concerned. I believe you have a tumor. He could not put, he hardly got the colonoscopy device through because that tumor had narrowed my colon. And he said, I want you to come and see me in the office tomorrow. Don't eat anything. Stay on a liquid diet. So the next day he came and he said, Mr. Hatch, you have a tumor that's the size of a softball in your abdomen and it's almost closed up. We need to do surgery. And I said, oh, a tumor the size of a softball. How unique. I think I'd like to have that in my life. I think I want to go on for a while that way. Um, he said, if it had closed up, you would have had to have a bag. Well, I had already decided, uh, whatever you got to do, doctor, let's get that thing out. And so we left his office and we got in the car and we drove a short distance to the emergency room. And he said, I'll let them know you're coming. And I walked in there and had myself admitted. And I said, please, please, please remove whatever you need to remove uh, cancer so that I might go on living and so I was fine with having a little bit of pruning done in my life I was very thankful for anesthesiologists and their work 
so that they could knock me out and I didn't have to be awake while that whole procedure was being done. Amen? So that was okay. But now sometimes there are things that God wants to prune out of our lives that we don't want to have removed. And so we argue and fight. It could be a loved one. It could be something that we really enjoy and we can't do anymore. God says, you don't need that because you're not producing fruit like I want you to. So I'm going to prune it back. That's hard. That's not pleasurable. I'll be honest. But He gives me discipline so that I might bear more fruit proverbs 3 verse 12 for whom the lord loves he corrects just as a father the son in whom he delights what i've never heard this before i'm sorry you should have been hearing it all along in your christian walk that god will discipline you to cause you to bear more fruit In Hebrews, it says this. Uh, He was talking about sin, the author, but he says, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. (laughs) You haven't even had to shed blood when you're fighting against sin in your life. And you've forgotten to the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him, For whom the Lord loves, He chastens and scourges every son whom He receives. Ladies, that means you too. Don't sit back and say, Whew, those men, they're going to be in big trouble. No, it's for you too, ladies. He chastens and scourges every child whom He receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. If you're a child of God, He is going to discipline you to where you produce fruit and more fruit. I don't want to hear that. I don't like that. I'm sorry. It's what the Bible says. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us, as seemed best to them, but He for our profit, that we may be partakers of His holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. (laughs) Every time I read that, I think about my dad saying, okay, bend over the bed. He'd pull off his belt. Sometimes he would say, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. Now, I was not smart enough. I would just, I was, okay, I, I deserve it. Let me have it. But I've heard a smart kid saying, if it's going to hurt you more than it's going to hurt me, why don't we turn this around and I'll spank you? I didn't dare say that to my dad. Because I'd get it worse. And that once I had children, once we had children and had to discipline them, we understood what my, I understood what my dad was saying. It was hurting him more than it was hurting me. That discipline was never pleasant. I didn't like it. Especially, I'd do something at church. And my dad would pull me aside after church and say, we're going to have a little talk when we get home. I knew what that meant. Then we'd go out to a restaurant. And I'd have to be all pleasant and nice at the restaurant when all I wanted to do was cry, waiting for what was going to happen when we got home. My mom and dad would be saying, now boys, you quit your sniffling and crying and nothing has happened yet. You just be pleasant and eat your dinner and we'll take care of it when we get home. Except they said a little nicer. We get home and then we go in the bedroom. I was hoping they'd forget, but they never forgot. But it yields 
the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. When I am discipled, when I am disciplined, when I have the right things done in my life, it changes me to make me do what God wants me to do. And it may not be pleasant. This is what Peter said. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Remember Hebrews said, you've not suffered unto bloodshed yet fighting sin. Well, it may be God has to do something. Jesus said, if your eye offends you, poke it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. Some of us might need to have some body parts removed. Some of us that we should suffer in the flesh to cease from sin, that we should no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime undoing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries i wish that it didn't say back there in john 15 every branch that bears fruit he prunes that it might bear more fruit i wish it didn't say it but it says it and so it should be as no surprise i am not a preacher that's going to say everything's going to be all right and if you're a christian then you'll have health and wealth and be blessed and everything will just be hunky-dory because that's not true That's not what the Bible says. If anybody says that to you, they're a liar. We are going to have sufferings in our life. And some of it is because God's working to cause us to bear fruit. And I should be thankful that God allows. Now, some of it is just because we're, I'll say it nicely, we're stupid. And we do stupid things. And we get ourselves into a stupid situation. But some of it is God saying, okay, here's what I want you to do now. Here's what I'm going to cut out of your life so you'll have more fruit. I am so glad that it tells us in the Word of God that He is going to help us, that His presence is going to be with us, and that He'll provide. His presence will give me guidance so that I will know that I need to bear fruit. His presence will give me sustenance so that I might bear fruit. And His presence gives me discipline that I might bear more fruit. When we struggle in our Christian walk, we need to remember that God is with us. Every step of the way. And He wants to work in your life. Probably all of us could say that There's a loved one that we miss that we would love to have back in our lives. Someone that gave us advice, someone that helped us through the tough times, whether it be a parent, a sibling, a spouse, a child. But life is not like that. But instead, God has given us Himself. Someone to be with us. Someone to provide what we need. The Holy Spirit to work in our lives so that we might produce fruit because that's the ultimate goal of God. And just as there's a whole lot of different kinds of fruits, there's a whole lot of different things that God wants to do in your life. But whatever He wants to do in your life, remember, it's all for the glory of God. So don't come up and say, Pastor, this is the fruit that God has given me to do because if it doesn't line up with the glory of God, it's not the right fruit. I've got a great talent for robbing banks, Pastor, and that's the fruit that God gave me. Uh Uh-uh, that's not true. Ask God to work in your life to help you to see what He wants you to give you. To help and to help you see His unfailing presence in your life. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. Thank you for uh, John chapter 15, where it talks about the vine and the branches and how we're the branches. We cannot do anything without you. 
but how you work in our lives to cause us to bear fruit. Whether it be the fruits of the Spirit or whether it be winning people to Jesus, telling our family, friends about Jesus, Lord, and that's whatever kind of fruit that you want us to bear. It's all for your glory. But help us when we get to a point where we sort of are struggling to remember that God's presence is there. He's with us and he's helping us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, if there's anyone that's listening today and has not ever trusted in Jesus Christ, that they might consider that. They might think about trusting in Jesus. Admitting they're a sinner, believing that Jesus died on the cross for them and rose again the third day to go up into heaven and confessing that He is Savior and they have a need. Lord, I just pray that You might be with us. Thank You for all that You do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, leaders, uh, we are going to try to have a Zoom meeting on Tuesday night. We have some things to discuss. So uh, uh, leaders, be aware of that. 6.30 or 7 o'clock will zero into the time. I probably only need about half an hour. So I'll let you know. Uh, we're still collecting items to go to Mexico. We got a, a truck and a trailer load of stuff, appliances and stuff uh, that came in. It's in the fellowship hall right now. And uh, with, there's also some items in the uh, trailer ready to go. And I know pa Brother Hoovenall appreciates that. We also, uh, we have some little booklets that we're going to give out to you to give out to others uh, before Ash Wednesday. So we'll have them out next Sunday so that you can give that out. Because believe it or not, Ash Wednesday is coming up pretty quick. All right. And uh, I, we also ordered some in Spanish for him to give out to his people. And so uh, it was a blessing for them. But uh, we're helping with that. Um, in March, on Sunday night, from 6 to 7, we're going to begin a Bible survey. And we'll be marching pretty steadily. We're going to try to do two or three books a night. And it will take us, starting in March, until like the end of September. Um, I, when you come, I will give you the, the packet of information that you need for that night. Uh, if you want to watch online, some of you that will not be able to be here, um, I will give you the link to the material so you can get it and look at it and use it. We're uh, using it as a gift from another ministry, and so we're appreciative of that, and uh, we want to find out what God's Word is all about. So that's in March. Please remember to give, whether you give online or give in the offering plate. God has blessed us and taken care of us, and we appreciate that, all that He's done for us. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer for us as we close our service. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you do. Bless us this week. Help us to look for the things in our lives that we need to change, that we might have more fruit, that we might have abundant fruit. Lord, I ask that you might bless us and keep us safe. Make your, fi your face to shine upon us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.